Okay, so hi again, everyone. My name is uh, Marcus Salvatore, and I'm an anesthesiologist at CVICU attending at Toronto General Hospital with an interest in perioperative echocardiography. And today we'll be talking about TEE for septal myectomy with a focus on intraoperative decision making. I have no disclosures or competing interests. Uh, and in terms of acknowledgements on the left are my mentors in echocardiography and cardiac anesthesia who are world-renowned for their expertise. Particular thanks goes to Dr. Ahmad Omran, consultant cardiologist who helped to develop this lecture. I also want to acknowledge the talented roster of cardiovascular surgeons that we have here at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center. And to that end, I would like to introduce Dr. Anthony Ralph Edwards, a cardiovascular surgeon here at TGH with specialist expertise in septal myectomy. He's a preeminent authority in the surgical correction of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, performing 50 to 70 procedures per year for patients referred from across Canada. He joins the call today to answer questions and to provide a valuable surgical perspective. Thank you, Dr. Ralph Edwards. Thank you, Marcus. Overdid the introduction a little bit. <laughs> so although we are steering this echo series more towards an interactive case review, we will quickly review the guiding tenets of the TEE exam for the surgery. We'll critically appraise cases involving septal myectomy in which TEE was used to refine diagnoses, detect new pathology, adjust the surgical plan, and assess surgical results. We'll also interpret TEE findings in the context of the surgical literature and best practices. So Holcomb is the most common inherited cardiac disorder, remarkable for both its genetic and clinical variability. Epidemiological studies estimate a prevalence of approximately 0.2% of the population, or one in 500 individuals. As with most of echocardiography, I find it easier to remember the cardinal features if I understand the key anatomic and structural changes that underlie this disease. The six features listed on the left have the most diagnostic utility, whereas those listed on the right are ancillary findings that can be used to support a diagnosis. We will explore these six findings in more depth in the upcoming slides. So although the focus of this talk will be septal myectomy for Holcomb, symmetric and asymmetric ventricular hypertrophy can result from a host of common conditions listed here. As a result, you may be faced with an incidental finding of high LVOT gradients or SAM during the course of routine revascularization or valve surgery. It is important to know how to assess and interpret these findings to determine whether modifications to the surgical plan are necessary. The most common non-genetic cause for asymmetric hypertrophy is a ventricular septal bulge, commonly seen in older patients with long-standing hypertension. The prevalence of VESB increases significantly with age and is found in approximately 20% of patients by the age of 80. Although often seen as a benign condition, VSB can still cause high LVOT gradients, SAM, and significant MR with pathological consequences. See review paper by Canepa et al. in 2016 for a detailed comparison. Nearly any pattern and distribution of LV wall thickening can be observed in Hokum, with the basal anterior septum in continuity with the anterior free wall being the most common location for LVH. So the TEE for septal myectomy starts by accurately defining the borders of the intraventricular septum. This relies on four principal measurements, including the distance from the right coronary cusp to the maximal septal thickness, the, ma the maximal septal thickness itself. Now, a clinical diagnosis of Holcomb in adult patients can be established by demonstrating a maximal wall thickness of over 15 millimeters anywhere in the left ventricle in the absence of another cause of hypertrophy in adults. This measurement is crucial but challenging as it is often difficult to distinguish the boundary between the interventricular septum and the right ventricular endocardium. The myocardial fibrosis that characterizes Holcomb can sometimes yield differences in echogenic texture which can aid in this distinction. The third is the distance from the right coronary cusp to the distal narrowing. And finally, the distal narrowing itself. So this brings us to our first poll, and thank you, Raphael, for helping to arrange the interactivity. And the question is, which of the following are true? And you can select all that apply. So A, measurements should be made in end systole when the gradient is highest. B, measurements should be made in end diastole when the walls are thinnest. C, TEE overestimates thickness compared to cardiac MRI. Uh, 
or D, the surgical resection follows the line from the RCC to the distal narrowing. So I'll give you about five seconds or 10 seconds or so to lock in your answers and then we'll keep moving. Okay, I think that's most of the respondents and we'll end the poll there. So the results, I can bring them up here, show that the majority of people feel that the measurements should be made in the end diastole, which is correct. That's the time when we make the measurements and TE overestimates thickness compared to cardiac MRI is the other correct answer here. So B and C, uh, were correct, and the measurements should be made in endiastole when the measurements are thinnest, and the myectomy is performed during cardiopulmonary bypass, obviously, when the heart is completely collapsed. So the measurements that the surgeon uses to make the incisions, you want to be uh, in a relaxed state. And then an observational study by Fellen et al. in 2017 compared ventricular septal measurements in Holcomb across varying imaging, various imaging modalities and showed only modest correlation between echo and MRI measurements. Specifically, MRI showed the greatest correlation with transthoracic echo, but TEE measurements were on average 13% larger uh, than an MRI. So uh, it definitely varies by center, but at our institution, we perform cardiac MRIs uh, for all patients that are coming from myectomy. So the next feature that we look for is LVO turbulence and gradient. And LV outflow tract obstruction, either at rest or with provocation, is present in approximately 75% of patients with Holcomb. The, there are two primary mechanisms responsible. And the first is the septal hypertrophy with narrowing of the LVOT, causing abnormal blood flow dynamics. The second are the anatomic alterations in the mitral valve and apparatus, which we will discuss in more detail shortly. The presence of a peak LVOT gradient of over 30 millimeters of mercury is considered to be indicative of obstruction. With resting or provoked gradients over 50 millimeters of mercury, generally considered to be the threshold for septal reduction therapy. Continuous wave Doppler in the deep transgastric view will often show a late peaking or dagger shaped trace. This characteristic Doppler profile occurs because the LVOT obstruction is dynamic and sensitive to ventricular loading conditions and contractility. Although ejection begins normally as, as systole progresses, the outflow tract narrows due to increased pressure and myocardial contraction. This gradient then worsens as the ventricle empties, causing the peak gradient to occur late in systole. Now, ideally during these surgeries, we wish to demonstrate a high baseline LVOT gradient that then resolves in the post-pump study following the myectomy. However, there are several hemodynamic changes that occur under general anesthesia, which may diminish the LVOT gradient, such as reduced sympathetic tone, volume loading, bradycardia, and decreased myocardial contractility. As a result, the baseline LVOT gradients may be normal, or at least under the therapeutic threshold. In these cases, we often provoke gradients using one or more maneuvers, including Valsalva, myocardial irritation to induce PVCs, or dibutamine infusions as shown here. The flow turbulence through the LVOT is also what causes the fluttering or early systolic closure of the aortic valve during mid-systole. The reasons behind this phenomena are incompletely understood owing to the complex fluid dynamics involved. One of the oldest theories remains the most dominant, with Sabe et al. from 8, 1982, suggesting that turbulent flow is associated with an increase in the kinetic energy of blood through the LVOT. Because the total amount of energy remains constant, the increased kinetic energy occurs at the expense of a reduction of pressure in the LVOT proximal to the aortic valve. The resultant pressure gradient across the aortic valve is what leads to the premature closure. Now, mitral valve physiology in patients with Holcomb is abnormal for two principal reasons. The first is abnormal flow dynamics through the LVOT as already described. And the second and commonly underappreciated issue is that the mitral valve is structurally abnormal in these patients. 
The mitral valve leaflets are often elongated, and there is anterior displacement of the papillary muscles and mitral valve apparatus, which predisposes these patients to SAM. During early systole, the tip of the anterior mitral leaflet is dragged into the LVOT by the venturi effect of mid-systolic flow. This is termed systolic anterior motion, or SAM. The displaced anterior mitral valve leaflet results in poor mitral valve leaflet coaptation and eccentric posterior directed MR in mid to late systole. MR severity relates to the degree of LVOT obstruction. Now, one of the dogmas of echocardiography is that flow always goes in the direction of restriction. So if the anterior mitral leaflet is being pulled anteriorly, shouldn't the resultant jet also be directed anteriorly? Well, no. What happens in Holcomb is that the entire coaptation point of the mitral valve moves in the anterior direction. It is therefore the shorter posterior leaflet that can't reach the coaptation point, acting as the quote-unquote restricted leaflet, and the result is a posteriorly directed jet. So our first question for Dr. Ralph Edwards is which features of the baseline TE study are most important to you when performing a septomyectomy? Um, I think the goals of the procedure are obviously to relieve the obstruction. And to do this, we wanna remove the, the bulk of the, in the septum that, that's uh, causing the narrowing. The goal is to try and reduce the septal thickness to about one centimeter. So um, I'd like to know what the maximal uh, thickness is of the, the septum to gauge how much I want to remove. Um, the other thing that I need to know is sort of the, uh, the shape of this, this obstruction, whether it's very focal and, and, um, and limited or whether it's more generalized and involves the entire uh, septum. The um, short high obstructions are, are fairly easily resected with a very limited um, uh, you know, uh, resection, um, but the long ones uh, that involve most of the uh, septum, you, you have to be able to get to below the, the, uh, uh, the, sep the, uh, the mitral valve leaf leaflet, anterior mitral leaflet, so that there's no flow acceleration in the region of the anterior uh, leaflet of the mitral valve uh, so that you don't get SAM. So uh, to do this, um, we can either uh, say that I want to make the, the resection about one centimeter longer than the length of the anterior leaflet or uh, go one centimeter below the SAM septal contact point. So the SAM septal contact point um, the morphology of the septum and the thickness of the septum are the things that are interesting to me. Um, I must say, however, I don't make my decisions based on the intraoperative uh, transesophageal echo. Um, I find that um, oftentimes this uh, exaggerates the thickness of the septum, and I use the preoperative uh, uh, surface uh, study uh, to uh, guide the uh, resection in the vast majority of, of cases. Thanks so much. And uh, we're lucky enough to have a clip here uh, of a surgical memeic to be being performed. And uh, Dr. Ralph Edwards, would you uh, mind just walking us through this procedure? I know this isn't, let me just a disclaimer, this isn't Dr. Ralph Edwards' procedure himself, but he's agreed to uh, kind of walk us through the major steps. I know I know you tend to perform a different series of incisions and, uh, and that video is also available online, but um, uh, you just let me know when you'd like me to get started or if there's any preamble that you'd like. Um, this start. is a pretty, pretty fast clip, so I don't think I'm going to really be able to um, uh, talk while it's, it's running. Um, the, the myectomy um, classically uh, spans between the, uh, the middle of the uh, right coronary uh, sinus and the uh, lateral border of the mitral valve uh, annulus. And... Um, how I, I do this is I, I follow the uh, hinge point of the, the right and left um, uh, cusps of the aortic valve um, and make an incision about uh, two millimeters below this uh, right up to the commissure. And I make the first cut about a, a, a two millimeters deep. And then I sort of distract that, uh, that uh, cut line into the outflow tract and then make a identical uh, cut 
parallel to it, but it, at the uh, base of the first cut, so that you're kind of making a cut that's going straight up. And depending on how much you need to resect, you keep on doing this until you've achieved the thickness that you'd like to resect. And uh, then I put the retractor um, in this groove that I've created and then carry the resection into the ventricle. Um, uh, having said that, I, I then um, make an incision um, on the, uh, the medial uh, border of the, the mitral uh, annulus and uh, perform a resection below the um, membranous septum to sort of meet the, the first resection. And this is the extended myectomy. Um, I think that this can be done without uh, uh, too much increased risk for uh, heart block. And I do this pretty much as a standard routine now. The, the, the problem with this operation is it's a debulking procedure. So um, anywhere that you can get uh, muscle mass out of the outflow tract improves your, your results. Perfect, thanks. So the post myectomy study seeks to confirm that the resection was adequate with reduction or resolution of the, LV2, of the LVOT gradients and any related SAM. Inadequate resection results in persistent obstruction and symptoms while excessive or poorly placed myectomy can produce iatrogenic heart block and ventricular septal defects with mor morbidity and mortality rates reported as high as 6%. However, in sharp contrast, data collected from dedicated Holcomb centers have shown remarkably decreased operative mortality of around 0.4%, explained primarily by surgical experience, technique, improved myocardial preservation, and decreased pump times. The table here shows an average of the complication rates reported in the literature. However, notably in 2017, a retrospective review of the TGH experience, including Dr. Ralph Edwards, spanning 291 myectomies over four years, the authors reported a permanent pacemaker requirement in approximately 5% of patients and mortality of 0.3% with no iatrogenic VSDs, highlighting the advantages of designated Holcomb centers. So without further ado, let's get into the first case. So our first patient is a 65 year old female uh, that had Holcomb diagnosed as an incidental finding in 2020 during a workup for hypertension. She reported a two to three year history of worsening dyspnea and exertional fatigue with NYHA class three symptoms. Coronary angiogram shows multivessel coronary disease and her TTE shows I, uh, intraventricular septum of 18 millimeters with resting gradient of 67 millimeters of mercury and moderate SAM. She had mildly stenotic mitral valve and a mean gradient of six millimeters of mercury. Here is her four chamber view, which clearly demonstrates the gross asymmetric myocardial hypertrophy. Focus on the mitral valve shows clear SAM as well as severe mitral annular calcification with decreased leaflet mobility, especially at the base of both the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets. Clips of the aortic valve show the characteristic turbulence through the LVOT, as well as the aortic valve fluttering and early systolic closure. Unexpectedly, inspection of the mitral valve revealed that compared to the baseline study, the degree of MR had increased to severe. Furthermore, the jet was centrally directed as opposed to the posteriorly eccentrically directed, sorry, the posteriorly directed eccentric jet characteristic of SAM. This raised the possibility that a component of the MR was related to primary mitral valve dysfunction or structural abnormality in the valve itself. This freeze frame of the mitral valve further supports this possibility, as we see at least moderate MR by vena contracta beginning in early systole, far before the appearance of the SAM, as demonstrated here. Continuous wave Doppler gradients through the mitral valve shows reduced mitral valve gradient compared to baseline with a mean gradient of three millimeters of mercury. Inspection of the tri tricuspid valve revealed moderate TR directed towards the intraatrial septum, as well as an elevated RVSP. The RV appears thickened, suggesting that the elevated pulmonary pressures were chronic. The pulmonary hypertension in this case likely resulted from a combination of MR, MS, and diastolic dysfunction. So our second poll, and Raphael, if you could help, what would you recommend to the surgeon regarding 
mitral valve intervention in this case. We'll put it up for 15 seconds. We re recommend no intervention required. All MR is second to SAM. You would recommend to repair the mitral valve, replace the mitral valve, or discontinue bypass and reassess the mitral valve after myectomy. Okay, so I'll show you our polls here, which suggests that the majority of people feel that we should discontinue the bypass and reassess, reassess after myectomy. And Tony, from a surgical perspective, which features of the mitral valve or MR uh, would make uh, intervention more likely, in your opinion? Well, I think obviously, if you see that there is a structural abnormality in the in the valve that so it would you know indicate that it's much more likely that you're going to have to replace the the valve uh, um, also um, the timing of the mitral regurgitation um, mitral regurgitation that's related to sam occurs uh, late in systole so if you click through the frames um, once uh, if there's mitral regurgitation before there's turbulence in the outflow tract that would um, suggest uh, intrinsic uh, mitral regurgitation and a valve, uh, uh, the majority of the problem being related to the valve. And then an atypical appearance to the recurrent re regurgitant jet also would push you towards uh, thinking that um, this was a valve related problem and maybe not uh, so much related to SAM. Um, having said all this, um, we the, the loading conditions and effects that uh, anesthetic have on uh, mitral regurgitation are um, variable in, in uh, different patients and, and sort of difficult to pre project, uh, pre predict. And, um, you know, knowing what the MR looked like uh, before on the surface study um, can go a long way to, uh, you know, guiding you in the operating room uh, as well. Thanks. Okay, so we did what the audience suggested in this case, um, which was only uh, last month actually. And a septomyectomy was performed spanning the medial and lateral borders of the mitral valve annulus. The specimen was approximately eight millimeters in thickness and carried five centimeters into the ventricle. The lateral attachments of the papillary muscle heads were fully mobilized and the secondary cord or a strut corda between the anterior leaflet and the outflow tract were divided. Uh, uh, SVG was, uh, was performed to the LAD and the OM1 in order to treat the, the coronary obstructions that were identified in the preoperative angiogram. And then the plan was to perform the myectomy, discontinue bypass, reevaluate the mitral valve for MR. So the post myectomy study revealed complete resolution of the high LVOT gradients. The clip on the left shows high velocity but laminar flow through the LVOT, and that's often characteristic of patients of these patients upon discontinu discontinuation of bypass. Uh, if any provocation was required to elicit gradients during the baseline study, then you should again repeat those same provocation maneuvers as part of the post myectomy evaluation to yield a meaningful comparison. To everyone's surprise, a detailed examination of the mitral valve revealed complete resolution of the MR from severe initially to now trace without any intervention besides the myectomy performed. The resolution of the MR was also associated with a reduction in the RVSP and pulmonary pressures from 61 down to 46. So our third question for the audience is why was the MR centrally directed in this case? Or why didn't it appear uh, in the, as the eccentric posterior directed jet that's so characteristic of Holcomb and Sang? And Raphael, if you could put up the poll. So the options are because of the severity of the MR, uh, the mitral annual, annular calcification that was seen, the length of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, uh, that the valve was rheumatic and restricted, the degree of LA dilatation or the obtuse aortomitral angle. Those are the options that you have there. 
I'll just give you 10 seconds. Okay, so we have the highest uh, degree of respondents probably for MAC, degree of LA dilatation, and anterior mitral valve leaflet length. Okay, so the correct answer is the jet was anteriorly directed due to MAC. This is a rare finding and reported in only three out of 93 patients in a case series investigating MR and Holcomb from 2000. So the, in terms of the follow-up echo on post-operative phase two, it showed preserved left ventricular function, only mild MR, and an RVSP of 35, which continued to improve uh, after the surgery. Okay, now on to our second case, which involves aortic stenosis and a fibr fibromuscular ridge. So not a classic Holcomb case, but we just want to talk about uh, septal myectomies and, and asymmetric hypertrophy and other conditions as well. So this patient is a 72-year-old male that was referred for moderate aortic stenosis. He was otherwise healthy, but complained of worsening exertional dyspnea over the last year. His peak gradient on surface echo was 89 millimeters of mercury with an aortic valve area of 1.2 centimeters squared. He also had mild AI, but otherwise preserved by ventricular function. And although he was referred for a TAVI assessment, because he didn't have any additional comorbidities, he was thought he was best served with a surgical aortic valve replacement. So the four-chamber view here demonstrates the gross hypertrophy affecting both the right and left ventricle. The short axis of the aortic valve shows a very stenosed but clearly tricuspid aortic valve with three raphae. The metesophageal long axis view shows marked flow turbulence through the LVOT with the presence of a small but discrete fibromuscular ridge. This was an unexpected finding, not diagnosed during the preoperative TTE. Continuous wave Doppler from the deep transcastric view revealed a peak aortic valve gradient of 59 millimeters of mercury whereas the LVOT gradient only measured a mean of nine millimeters of mercury. Here we have three features that are combining to contribute to the LVOT gradient and high velocities, namely the aortic stenosis, the fibromuscular ridge, and the gross concentric hypertrophy resulting from longstanding AS. In terms of the surgery that was performed, this was a non- um, septal myectomy surgeon that was performing this uh, ad hoc procedure. And an aortic valve replacement was performed with a 23 millimeter alveolus bioprosthesis. And then the ad hoc component was the resection of this discrete fibromuscular ridge with a myectomy. After discontinuation of bypass, repeat assessment showed preserved LV function, but unfortunately with persistent turbulence through the LVOT despite the aortic valve replacement. Continued assessment showed an additional concerning finding not seen in the preoperative study. I'll give you a few seconds to make your assessment from these limited images. So our fourth question is, what is your assessment of the surgical intervention? And Raphael, if you could put up the poll. So is this paravalvular leak related to the tissue aortic valve that was in, in placed? Is this prosthetic valve stenosis or stuck leaflet? Is this a residual LVOT gradient? Is this a septal perforator? Or is this a iatrogenic VSD? I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> 
Okay, the poll's ended, and 81% say that this is a VSD, and that is the right answer. So color interrogation in the metasophageal four-chamber view clearly shows a restricted VSD in the perimembranous region at the site of the myectomy. The defect measures 0 0.6 centimeters using color flow Doppler. Or sorry, continuous wave Doppler. A freeze frame of the inflow outflow view confirms the size and continuous wave Doppler demonstrates peak velocities over four meters per second. Now a quick pause to demonstrate the difference between VSDs and unroofed, unroofed septal perforators. I feel that the similarities between these two entities are often overemphasized as they have distinct qualities that make them easy to tell apart in most cases. On the left, we have a VSD, which clearly shows high velocity turbulent flow during system, moving from the LV towards the RV or away from the probe. Conversely, on the right, we see unroofed septal perforators with low velocity diastolic flow into the left ventricle. So Tony, from a surgical perspective, how is this complication best managed? Well, I don't think you can you can leave it. I think you have to uh, close the, the defect that you've uh, created. Sometimes, if these things are small, you can you can find them and uh, put a, a, a pledged uh, stitch and just uh, bring it together that way. Um, if it's larger or um, or um, the, the muscle around it is not, won't take a, a stitch all that well, um, then probably a patch um, on the surface of the uh, outflow tract in the left ventricle is the way to go and make the patch uh, redundant so that uh, the pressure is sort of distributed over a large uh, patch area so that it, the patch is pushed into the, the defect uh, during systole and you get a good uh, approximation and closure. And is there a difference if you approach this repair from the left ventricle or from the right ventricle? Um, well, you, you, it depends on obviously where the, the, the hole is. Some locations are more difficult than others. The typical um, location actually for a VSD is in the RVOT, uh, just at the base of the uh, outflow tract below the, the pulmonary valve. As you're making the incision sort of uh, curve around, um, it, sometimes it, you have a tendency to flare and uh, get deeper as, as, you, as you go around the corner. So that's probably the most common uh, place. And um, that's fairly amenable to a pledged repair in the, in the RVOT. Um, things that are in, in a different location are probably best uh, dealt with uh, with a patch um, placed from the from the left ventricle. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, and poll number five. How will a paramembranous VSD affect your hemodynamic measurements? And Raphael, if you could put up the poll. Yeah, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to answer. Great, and poll results, 56% uh, say underestimate LVOT gradient and 56% uh, say RV and pressure volume overload. Sorry, I realized I changed the, uh, the final answer uh, after submitting these to Raphael, so that's my fault. But both of those, both of those answers are correct. Okay, so in terms of the case to follow up, the VSD was repaired with a pledgeted suture, as uh, Tony suggested. The postoperative day three echo unfortunately showed persistent residual uh, peak LVOT gradients of 30 millimeters of mercury, as well as a persistent three to five millimeter restricted VSD with left to right shunt, a peak gradient of 60, uh, which was decided to manage conservatively, although there was a referral made to the structural heart team for assessment, and they also 
uh, felt that conservative management was best in this case. The mean aortic valve gradient was 14 millimeters mercury with no AI, but this will also be underestimated in the context of a paramembranous VSD. There's preserved LV function and the patient was discharged home on postoperative day 10. Okay, for our last case, we're gonna be discussing uh, Holcomb, a uh, combination of Holcomb and uh, aortic insufficiency. So our third case involves a 69-year-old female with an incidental finding of a murmur during workup for cataract surgery. She had worsening symptoms over the past four years and she's now NYHA class three, meeting criteria for intervention. No frank heart failure symptoms, but a transthoracic surface echo showed uh, intraventricular septum of 18 millimeters with a resting gradient of 74 millimeters of mercury and moderate SAN. There was only trivial AI detected on the preoperative study. In the four-chamber view, we see the characteristic hypertrophy, as well as an increased amount of regurgitation through the aortic valve compared to the preoperative study, and now being graded is mild. A focused long axis view of the aortic valve shows that the aortic valve is structurally normal that the AI jet is central without prolapse or billowing. And although it appears eccentric in this view, I think that's only because the septum is bulging into the LVRT. Otherwise it would appear as a centrally directed jet. So in terms of the surgical details, the aortic valve was tri-leaflet and the leaflets were thickened, but mobility was not impaired. There was calcification noted at the base of the left coronary cusp. A septal myectomy was performed spanning between the medial and lateral borders of the mitral valve annulus. The specimen was approximately one centimeter in thickness and carried 3.5 centimeters into the ventricle and secondary chordae between the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the outflow tract were divided. The lateral aspects of the papillary muscle heads were mobilized. Examination of the aortic valve post myectomy though, now reveals a second jet of AI it's extremely eccentric, directed towards the right coronary cusp, implicating an issue with either the left or non-coronary cusp. This is a new jet that wasn't present in the preoperative study. So the options here uh, we'll get into uh, with the next poll, but I'm just gonna let you take a look and examine these views. And uh, just as a reference point, the bottom jet is likely the original central coaptation jet, and the jet uh, closer to the anterior mitral valve leaflet is the new jet arising post myectomy. Here's additional views, including a short axis view, which show the two jets. And finally, a 3D. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the color isn't, uh, there's, there wasn't color uh, added to this uh, image in particular, but shows at least uh, a 3D view with the arrow directed towards the left coronary cusp. So the question uh, for the audience or poll number six is what is the mechanism for the worsening AI post myectomy? Is it RCC prolapse? Is it left coronary cusp restriction? Is it remodeling of the LVOT, a left coronary cusp perforation, or a central coaptation defect? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to answer. Okay, so the majority of respondents said 80% said left coronary cusp perforation. And that is the correct answer. So 
the air autonomy was reopened and the valve was inspected and there was a tear present between the border of the calcification at the base of the leaflet and the more normal leaflet. This was repaired with a pledgeted 7-0 proline suture and the pledget material was pericardium. Reassessment of the aortic valve following the, aortic, uh, the repair showed that now the original central coaptation is unchanged compared to the baseline study and the new regurgitant jet from the perforated left coronary cusp has been repaired and resolved completely. Again, examination of the short axis view reveals that that second color jet is no longer visible. So the follow-up on post-operative day four showed uh, normal uh, LV size and systolic function. The basal septum myectomy site measured five millimeters and no perforator or VSD flow was seen. And there was mild to moderate AI that was detected in the post-operative study with an AI pressure half time of around 40, 430 milliseconds. So for Tony, the question was, how can you minimize the risk of injury to the aortic valve during my myectomy? In that video, we saw that that Ross retractor is directly over the RCC. And in this case, it was an LCC injury. But uh, is there anything that can be done to try to minimize the um, the likelihood? Well, I don't know. I've I've done literally thousands of these cases, and there's a, I can only remember two cases where um, patients have uh, had uh, injury to the aortic valve or uh, had the AI that like this was the only case where we discovered it after the fact. Um, with the Ross retractor, if um, if you have a, um, a a assistant that sort of uh, balances their weight against the aortic valve, and then if the valve slides out from under the retractor, I've had the uh, right coronary cusp evolved basically, um, and that was one case. And now uh, I instruct the um, the assistant as to how to hold with a static hold where you just place the retractor, fix it in place. And if the heart slides away, it slides away and we reposition it. And um, that's the only time I've had that happen. And that was fortunately repairable. The, the tear was right at the insertion um, of the leaflet and it could be sewn back. And um, actually with long-term follow-up, it's, it's been, it was okay. Um, this more recent one, I think the, you know, the delusional cardiac surgeon answer to this is that um, in the region where the, the hole was in the left coronary cusp, there was a, a, a calcific uh, plaque, and it's possible that deforming the valve in, in some way with the forceps uh, while I was doing the myectomy, uh, um, maybe I was a little bit too forceful and it's, it, it, um, it uh, caused this this tear or the the calcification actually cut through the the more normal uh, leaflet adjacent to it, or it's also possible that um, I did it with with the knife. I mean, I've done a lot of these and it isn't a problem, so I'm I'm not really sure. Fortunately, it was relatively easy to fix. It's just a matter of uh, really keeping track of uh, multiple things while you're you're doing this. You have to sort of stay focused on the end of the blade all the time. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, have your retractor assistant uh, aware that they shouldn't uh, pull harder if things are, are, are slipping, but this is not a, a common, not a common problem. So it seems in reviewing the, the literature, the, in the initial Moro series, it seems to suggest that the AI that, or the rate of AI that he reports was actually higher than is reported anywhere now currently with modern techniques. Was That's, there anything specific that she, sorry, go ahead. Well, that the, it used to be that uh, people would open the aorta with what they call the hockey stick incision. And um, typically the incision would go along the sinotubular junction and then drop into the non-coronary sinus. Uh, 
which um, is perfect if you're replacing an aortic valve because um, the the, uh, the sinotubular junction is is uh, narrowed and you oftentimes can't get the prosthesis through it if you just cut transversely. Um, but uh, when you sew up these um, incisions um, that transverse the STJ, um, you alter the anatomy of the valve and you, you cause uh, prolapse and leaking of the valve. So I think um, older series, um, probably they weren't quite aware of that. They used to think that it had something to do with lack of, of um, support of the, non, the uh, right coronary cusp because of the myectomy that was uh, performed or possibly uh, dilating the valve by using the retractors. But I, I think it's more um, a distortion of the valve created by um, traversing the, the STJ. Now the incisions are one centimeter above the STJ and never uh, drop across it. So it's, it's not so much of a problem. Perfect, thanks so much. Okay, and that brings us to the end of our talk. Um, Dr. Alfred, or Tony, would you like to, uh, to add anything to what we've discussed today? Um, I, think, <laughs> I think there's a lot of nuances uh, to this uh, disease. There are a lot of um, presentations that sort of um, mimic the uh, physiology, but uh, you arrive there at, at very much different um, uh, uh, anatomic substrates. Uh, anywhere from, you know, elongation of the aorta and, um, you know, hypertensive uh, uh, cardiomyopathy to um, uh, calcification of the posterior leaflet and um, movement of the anterior leaflet uh, uh, or the coaptation point uh, forward more into the outflow tract. Um, and uh, there are multiple ways to, to get to the same physiologic effect. And uh, sometimes um, these things sort of play into uh, what you do about uh, fixing it. Perfect. Thanks. I really appreciate you being involved today and answering our questions. And now we can open it up to the uh, 